We, we are in the month of Elul. And uh, one of the things, as, as Christians who understand that we've been grafted into the root of the Jew, is that we need to understand somehow or other the, the cycle uh, that, that runs through the Jewish faith and that they have hold of something that within Christianity is, is pretty much lost. Uh, within Christianity, life is viewed through the Western eyes of a linear approach. You start in one place, and then life is simply a continuous journey forward. And in that journey forward, in, in Western culture, it's very easy to forget the past, ignore the past, uh, fail to learn the lessons of the past, or, or to appreciate it. So if we were to take a look at anything within the, within the contemporary church, especially here in America, we find that as the church is moving, in many ways it's moving away from uh, significant portions of its evangelical roots. I'm talking about the Bible-believing church here. I'm not talking about the liberal church. I'm talking about those who still claim to be uh, born again, to believe that somehow that, that's a valid experience, who will say that they're committed to the Bible, they take the Bible as a word of God. But while that's what's said, Barna keeps finding these, these very scary statistics as people say one thing, but are living their lives out at an entirely different level. And, and so while people will say, Yeshua is Lord, and Yeshua said, I am the way, the truth. No man comes to the Father but by me. There's a significant number of evangelical millennials who no longer believe that Jesus is the only way. That's only going to get worse. Uh, in our politically correct culture, which, which, by the way, does not allow you to say anything negative about any religion except Christianity. You are allowed on the college campuses, you are allowed uh, in the high school curriculum to point out negative things about Christianity uh, and its history. And, and so a lot will be said, for example, let me just give you an example. A lot will be said that, that evangelical or fundamentalist Christians are anti-gay. They're homophobic. It, it may be a truth I'm just missing, but in my perusal across the news media in this country, I don't find anyone saying that about Islam. I don't find headlines and people getting stirred up that Muslims are homophobic. And, and yet the truth is that homosexuality is viewed in the Quran just like it is in the Judeo-Christian scriptures. And the truth is that to my knowledge there is no Christian nation on this planet now killing homo, homosexuals because they're homosexuals, but there are quite a number of Islamic countries that do that regularly. So how is it that Christianity is bashed, but Islam is off limits? You, you see, it's... it's, it's it's a church moving in a direction where it's failing to circle around and say, wait a minute, let's go back and let's see if we can learn things from our history. So one generation is failing, and this, by the way, I don't mean to pick on the church because Israel did the same thing. The whole Bible is, you know, people who love God, their children know about God, their grandchildren barely hear about God, and their great-grandchildren are now serving idols. Everything falls apart in society, there's a revival, and people come back to God, 
and they have a personal encounter with Yahweh and their children are brought up to, to follow the ways of Yahweh because the, grand, the parents remember how bad it was, but the ch children never totally embrace it, so their children, it is now a religion, and for the next generation, it is back to idolatry. I, I, I remember as a, as a young Christian looking at that pattern in the scriptures and saying, you know, how stupid can you be? But I'm living in a day and age now where I see things that are accepted as normal and right and even called biblical in, in, in our society among churches for which there is no biblical evidence and quite a, a lot that says the opposite. Now, why, why do I say all that? Because we're in the month of Elul. And maybe we as Christians need to understand there's a value in seeing that time is a cycle that's an ascending cycle. And so rather than in the Greek Aristotle uh, Western thinking where you start at A and you grow in a straight line until eternity, that eternity really is the coming around to the same kinds of events and times in a cycle that's ascending. Now, it's ascending so that it's not where it was last year, but it's in a cycle because you didn't get it all last year. Come on, get, get, put, that, put that in your thinking. It's not that God's into boring repetition. It, it's not meant to be boring repetition. It's, it's meant to be that when we come to Rosh Hashanah, when we come to Sukkot, when we come to Passover, that as we come to the cycle this year, that we are more deeply enriched by it than we were last year. And if in fact, Rosh Hashanah, Sukkot, Passover, all, all the festivals, if they become boring, then our challenge is we are in, we're in a linear world. And a linear world doesn't want to keep doing what it always did. It's got to jazz it up. It's got to find significant meanings. Uh, let me give you an example of a linear world among the Jews, because not all Jews are Hebraic thinkers. And Jews in America, to my knowledge, this doesn't happen to Jews in much of the world, but it does in America. Jews in America are now a gener generations and generations and generations. They have become westernized. They may or may not attend a synagogue. But here's what's interesting. There's a holiday that the Christians celebrate called Christmas. And the big symbol of Christmas is the Christmas tree. That's a symbol. I mean, here we are, because somebody might be watching this later, we're here at the beginning of September, and local stores already are getting their Christmas trees out. <laughs> so what do we see in Judaism in America? You won't find it in Israel much. You find what's called Hanukkah trees. It's decorated a little more subdued, but it is obviously evidence of Jewish parents who have no idea at all about what their faith teaches, wanting their Jewish children not to feel left out at Christmas time. And so they now have Hanukkah trees. That is linear thinking. And linear thinking will lead you eventually. Well, I'm sure glad we're, 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 we're taping this tonight. <laughs> Linear thinking will always lead you to idolatry. 
because linear thinking will always want to reject the ways of the Creator and replace them with the ways of man. I haven't thought this through enough to make comments on it, but I, I suspect that's true in the educational world, and I suspect it's true in the business world, and I suspect it's true in the political world. Come on. That as man moves away from a God-centered view of life and moves more towards a so-called secular, it's not secular, it, it's just a different religion. The religion is called humanism and man is at the pinnacle and how they ever arrive at that I don't know. But that linear move ultimately leads to socialism, dictatorships, tyranny. It ultimately ends up in tyranny because you have an antichrist. So it always leads to total control of the people and a loss of freedom. You can't cut, cut a society off from God and believe that people are going to be treated equal. Come on. All men are created equal, said our forefathers. Now it took a many years and a civil war to begin to make that happen. The truth of the matter is that for the beginning of American history, the African American was not treated equal under our system that said they should be equal. We were well behind the curve of other nations. Ahead of others because, by the way, slavery still exists in huge numbers in Islamic countries. Slavery still, but nobody's going to report about it. I mean, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people who are enslaved. But, but, but I, I want to make the point is this that as our forefathers laid a biblical foundation, there was now a pressure, the pressure of the Word of God against the cultural norm, which was slavery's acceptable. And, and it pushed and pushed until the very fabric of the nation itself was right at the point of disintegration. I mean, think where the world would be today if, in fact, America had been split by the Civil War. Okay? We, we, really, we really can't wrap, wrap our head around that. And so there was this pressure. Now, again, so the war was one, you notice, it did, still didn't change people. Come on. You don't change racial prejudice by laws alone. You don't change racial prejudice by making a statement that all men are created in the image of God. And so while we fought a great war and more Americans were killed in the Civil War than all of our wars combined. Think about that. But coming out of that war, it wasn't over. And so we still had uh, segregation in the South. Separate drinking fountains, separate entrances. The African American was treated as a sub-citizen, had a right to vote, but was intimidated not to. And somewhere in the 60s, you know, we as a nation began to deal with that more in a legal way. and, and more, more to establish that if we're going to say all men are equal, how do we do that? Now, remember, if, if we were Hebrew thinkers, we'd be in a, in a constant awareness of a cycle. And that we should come around the cycle of understanding equality at a higher 
level than three decades ago. So we didn't really understand equality in the late 1700s the way we understood it in the 1800s. Then we have a massive civil war, and, and, and as a nation, we embrace a, a higher level of, of what equality means. But then we get, it, we're in the 1940s, that's still not there. We go to World War II, we still have segregated battle units in the U.S. Army. Come on. Uh, so, so, you know, it, we, but, but what are we doing? We're coming around in, in a cycle. Well, okay, it's almost like God is saying, you have a chance to get it right now. You have a chance to change some things now. And, and, and so through uh, Dr. Martin Luther King and, and the amazing, powerful, uh, you know, witness he was to change that and the mobilizing uh, of, of a nation toward that, uh, you know, we, if we look at life in a circle, then we should be coming around. We should be at a point now, 50 years after the 50s or after the 60s, where we're at the highest level of integration in the world. And we are, in fact, going backwards. Do you understand what I'm saying? We're going backwards uh, in, in universities, African Americans wanting their own dorms. In, in the 1950s, we were having riots in the street because they had their own dorms. You can't put us in our own dorms, that's segregation. And, and, and now a move, they want their own dorms. And then a major university last year, we're going to have a separate graduation ceremony for the African-Americans. C- come on, let, let's just put this out there. there. There is a group. I'm not saying all African-Americans that way, but I'm saying African-Americans better wake up because the tide is going back towards total segregation. And in the process of that, there is now a tremendous hostility toward the white man. I mean, th- this, is, this is our culture, people. Now, you can be living in an environment where it's not there. I mean, I worked in, in three high-tech companies, and, and there were, you know, Oriental people, Asian people, Mexican people, and African-American people, and Caucasian people. And I, I never experienced in that company any judgments that one race or the other couldn't contribute to the team. I'm not saying it didn't exist in the, in the company. It, it, I, I'm sure it had to somewhere because people are people. I'm just saying at my level, traveling in Massachusetts, traveling in Texas, traveling on the West Coast, uh, again, I'm dealing with pretty high-tech people. I'm dealing with people who are managers and, and, and dealing with uh, engineers and things like this. I, I, I never saw it. I never saw anybody raise their eyebrow, roll their eyes, because somebody of a different race was talking. I, I, I just never saw that. We didn't, we didn't have to have lessons on it. Because we were in the sh- same ship, and we're going to sink or swim together. And, and if we're going to roll eyebrows at people, it's going to be those who don't pull their weight. Is this making some sense? And, and, and so now we're at the precipice, and I, I really believe it is a precipice. And, and why are we there? We're there because we're linear thinkers. And we have a gen- and when you're a linear thinker, you can only think of now. My generation, me, us. What's going on is everything I can conceive between the parameters of my life. It's like Johnny coming home and he, he got an A in English and he got an A in geography, but he only got a C in history. And his mother asked him why, and he says, well, Ma, they keep asking me about things that happened before I was born.
there's a, a shocking, shocking lack of awareness of history in our culture. Even among so-called leaders like congressmen and congresswomen who don't know basic sixth grade history of this country. So what happens in a Hebraic thinking, you missed it in this turn. You didn't get it in sixth grade, but we're going to come around and cover American history again in ninth grade. And by the way, you didn't get what you needed then, we're going to come around, we skip 10th grade, but in 11th grade, we come back to a different aspect of American history. And then you go to college and you're going around the circle and we come back and we're talking about American history. But in a linear world, it's like I had American history when I was 10 years old, I move in a straight line fashion, it's no longer part of my life. And so now I got to make decisions about now who we are, what we need to be doing, what's right, what's wrong, but I'm detached from any guidance of the past. Amazing. You know, people people in the world had a, a reaction when ISIS went around blowing up Buddhas. In a religious tolerant world, it's like I don't uh, agree with Buddha, but that's a, you know, that's a piece of world history that's 2,000 years old sitting there or however years. And I, ISIS, I mean, they did that, came in and blew up it, anything that was of a different religion. And people reacted and called that barbaric. And yet now we have a move going on from the left to destroy statues of American, American heroes who may have been on the other side of the Civil War. But why don't you take the time to find out who they were and what they believed and what they were working for rather than drop them in a, bomb, uh, a box that says you were a uh, a slave supporter, you were a racist, and we have to wipe your presence off the face of the earth, and we'll do it in any way we can. Now, we don't blow them up with, with, uh, with dynamite. We go to courts, and then we sue, and we take the Ten Commandments off, off the city hall walls, out of the schoolroom. Think about it. Whether you came from a religious family or not, in the 40s when you went to school that you more than likely heard the pledge to the flag that everybody did. You more than likely heard a student give a prayer and a Bible reading over the PA system. It was not uncommon when, when I went to school, that would be in the 50s primarily, late 40s, 50s. It, 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 would, it didn't shock me to see a Bible in a classroom. I mean, it might just be sitting on the shelf, but the Bible was there. And as a young boy growing up, therefore, I'm in a culture, whether I believe it or not, I'm in a culture where prayer and the Bible are part of my culture. where if I go to a, a court hearing, the witness puts his hand on a what? A Bible and says, I swear to tell the truth, so help me God. That was part of the culture where you could be a person who, who didn't really have any commitment to Jesus Christ you had no commitment to a church. You didn't even go to church. But you more than likely, more than likely, if I were a betting man, I'd, I'd put my dollar on it every time because I'd come out ahead. You believed in God. And there's a good chance that you believe that Jesus was a good man. And you probably believe that the Bible was a good book. 
I mean, that was common. So, so that, that as a Christian student, going to a school where the vast majority of my classmates did not go to church, there was no perceived difference between them and I about a ton of cultural issues of what's right and wrong. I believed homosexuality was wrong because the Bible says so. Most of my friends believed it's wrong. Not because the Bible says so. They believed it because that was in the culture. How to get in the culture? Because the Bible put it in the culture. And if you had any discussion about it, people automatically had judgments about that's not natural. Where did that come from? That's not natural. It came because we had a culture of it. Now we have to teach children in kindergarten that it is natural because their natural being knows it isn't. So what's happening? We have linear thinking. So we come out to a point where I'm out here. I've come through a liberal education. There's no God in the school, no prayer in the school. It's not that I'm not going to church that's my problem. It's that I've been in the hands of an education system that now spits me out to be the generation of the country moving forward with no moral basis. There's no basis for it. What's the basis of morality? There, there, there can be none. And so once you've stripped that out, then the culture starts moving again, literally. It never, it never has an opportunity to circle around. And there are voices in this nation and voices in our, in our, our churches that are trying to get people to circle around. I, I don't want you necessarily to become everything I am. I want you to consider history. I want to be able to have a discussion of where are we headed and how do we change that? Why is it bad now? Why was it good then? Can we have any factual discussions? When you start thinking in a linear passage, your whole life becomes what's going on. So right now, for example, tons of people are jumping on the socialism bandwagon and don't even know what it is. They don't have a clue what it means. They're totally incapable of saying, well, let's look at these two. So what does Yahweh do? He tries to bring, bring us back into a, a cycle of coming back. So when you look in the Bible at King Josiah, you find a man who loved God. And he had what he thought was everything that God wanted. But what he had was a religion. In the temple itself were idols. On every mountaintop, hillside around, there were worship objects to foreign gods in Israel. But this is the world he grew up in. He didn't look at it and say, that's wrong. Because in his world from a baby on, that idol was always there. He didn't know any different. And he said he loved the Bible, the Torah. Yesiah, have you read it? Well, no. In fact, I don't know anybody that has a copy of it. They had lost the Torah. When they find the Torah and they bring the scrolls to Yesiah, he gets the scroll, opens it up and reads it and starts reading God's judgment against the idolatry that he's looking at. And he tears his garment in repentance and cries out, we are in deep sneakers. As a, as a nation, not just I, the kingdom in deep sneakers, 
We as a nation are positioned for destruction. Unless we can get the Torah working again. Get back in that cycle where we, where we come. And that, is, is this making some sense to you? Yeah. So, the pull of linear thinking is, is significantly strong. When, when I understand that, that much of Judaism in America has lost their connection to Torah. You know, the average Jew uh, doesn't, has, has never even read the Torah. When I look at the average Christian and I see a, a growing disconnection with the Word of God, it's like, what is going to bring them back? Now, I don't need to point fingers over there, over there. Uh, this year has, has, has been a year where I've been involved in a lot of things that are unusual, things that I, you know, normally wouldn't expect to be on my plate. And, and as a result, it, it's, and many of you can relate to this, it, it's like you, you're running from one to chore to the next, but you're never quite finishing them all. And, and whether it's people issues, whether it's, you know, work issues, whatever it is, it just seems to be, where'd the last month go? Yeah. My, my mother used to say, time goes fast. When I was in eighth grade, I thought time dragged. I couldn't wait to get out of school. <laughs> and now time's like, didn't we just start like a couple of months ago, we're going to take a journey this year from here to there? That was January. We're now in September. And so in this busyness, I realized, where, where, where was I functioning? I was a linear thinking Gentile. I, I'm just telling you my experience. You know, if it weren't for Shabbat, and that Shabbat is an ascending cycle, uh, I, you know, I, I don't know what would happen. And, and, and so we're moving along, and uh, we're now, what, what's the 14th? Is today the 14th? 17th. 17th. We're, we're at the 17th day of Elul. This is one of those really rare things in the calendar, well, I think it's rare, but where the Hebrew calendar and the, uh, our other calendar line up, it's the 17th, and it's the 17th. 17 days into Elul, and this morning, I realized we're in Elul. Now, I know Rosh Hashanah is coming. And, and I know that's in the next month. I should be smart enough to say, and it's going to be here before you know it. Yes. But, but I had to ask myself the question today. What happened that I got my focus on whatever and didn't enter into the ascending cycle. And, and it was that I became a linear thinking. That, 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 that's just part of who we are in our culture. That, that's how we think. We don't talk about the ascending cycle. And so I, I quickly put into my life <laughs> uh, things today, uh, you know, connecting with a couple of new rabbis I hadn't heard from before who have some absolutely powerful teachings about Elul. I'm going to play uh, some of them for you at some point here. Maybe I'll just send you the email links and you can look at them. Uh, the one I, one I heard this morning, I had to stop and tell Donna, come here, you got to hear this, because he was saying things exactly the way Donna does. Wow. Do Donna is out on the edge about how... You, how and why you deal with what's right and acceptable in your life. Let me give you a short capsule. If you can't control the little things in your life, when the crisis comes, you won't control it. If you can't say no to what your body wants for this, then when a crisis comes, you've not trained your body how to respond. 
And that's exact. I've heard that's part of uh, Donna's confessions. Donna in her confessions has things. I I will reject things that are perfectly legal to me only so they don't control me. There's nothing biblically that says I can't eat this or drink this, but I'm going to make a decision I'm not to just because my body's craving it. Just because. That rabbi said the exact same thing. Exact same thing. A a a absolutely amazing. He talks about, uh, you know, getting up at four in the morning to go to the mikvah. And he has to walk by the bakery. And they're all, you know, in... in and where he lives, they're all starting to bake all their bacon. If you've been to Israel, most of you have here. Uh, it, it's, I mean, they're, they're into baked goods, man. I'll tell you, you bake, I mean, piles and piles and piles of, of baked goods. And he said, you know, you get up, you, you, on your way to the mikvah, and you're, you smell the bread cooking and the, and the chocolate croissants. And, you know, he said, yeah, that's exactly what he said. They're calling you. You know, and uh, so he made a commitment. He, he, he apparently likes cookies, and he, he made a commitment. He said, no, I'm just saying what I did. I'm not going to let my body con control me, so I told my body, you can't have a cookie until 2 o'clock. I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm just not going to let you do that. I'm not going to let the craving of my body dictate the decisions I make. And, and the reason being, so that when real trouble comes, he can control his reactions and overcome it. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So, uh, uh, so I, I, I plug back into Elul, and we're going to have some, uh, some really great teaching on it and everything. But one of the teachings of Elul fits in with where we are in Matthew 6. In Matthew 6, I'm going to jump down through a bunch of stuff, but, you know, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. You're going to be, you and I are going to be judged on what were we doing it for. If we are doing it for recognition, there will be no recognition or reward for it in heaven. Yeshua is very clear. You do something to be recognized here, that's what you get. But you do something uh, because you're supposed to, <laughs> and then that's what you get. I, I told you the story of doing a good thing, and I told it, and the Lord said, that's all you get. And just as I said this, this thought comes racing through me. I did an out-of-the-way, out-of-the-ordinary, unexpected thing for someone this week, and, and the, this thought comes, tell them that. <laughs> You know, the devil's a liar. I mean, doesn't he know I'm not going to do that again? All right. So, so jump down then. We're going all the way down to verse 9. So he's telling them how to pray, how, to, how they should do their righteousness, uh, you know, how to come into your private closet to pray. And in verse 9 he says this. This then is how you should pray. And what does he start his prayer with? Our Father in heaven. Our Father in heaven. Our Father in heaven. That is an a lul thing. And why is it a lul? Because he goes on and says, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The whole prayer Honoring Abba Yahweh in heaven is to get that kingdom down here. What was Yahweh the Creator's plan in the book of Genesis? It was to create the universe and to create an earth and to create man, but it was not that he could sit in heaven and once in a while man could break through and get to his realm. It was that he could come down and fellowship with his man. Come on. Think about within Christianity how much of our effort is 
How do we get to God? How do we have a breakthrough? As, as if there's a brick wall there between us and God that God's put. And we're trying to smash through and get through to God. Come on. And, and yet, when it comes to this, Yeshua says, our Father in heaven, he identifies him as a Father. He doesn't call him Yahweh. May your kingdom come here, just like it was in the beginning. Yeshua's attitude is, let's get, let's get the Father down here. Wow. What, what a different picture. Now, how, how does this tie into a loop? Elul is the month when the sages have taught that Abba Yahweh comes down to be among his people. And the phrase used is this, and you've heard me teach on this in the past. The king is in the field. On the pattern that they... The king is in Jerusalem. He's doing all his business from Jerusalem. Uh, if there's a war, the king belongs out with the troops. So where is the king? He's up in Damascus, you know, with the army fighting. They won the war. Where's the king? He's in the palace in Jerusalem or the summer palace here. But there was a month when the king came out of the palace so that he could walk among his people. And we may have opportunity to talk more in depth about this, but, but what is the purpose of the king walking among his people? One, as, as, as a human king, was so he knows where they are. Come on, his advisors may be seeing, saying everything's well. And then this is his month to be among the people, and he gets on his horse and chariot and starts going around through his kingdom and finds abject poverty all over the place that wasn't there last year when he went around. And, and, and he would say to his lead, what on earth is going on here? We've got to fix this. Secondly, his coming among the people was to encourage them. Come on. To encourage them. If we have a president that stays in the White House all the time and is never among the people, that doesn't encourage us. If we have a president that goes around and, and meets with the people and, and has, you know, rallies or whatever, you know, but, but that's encouraging to the people. The people get to see him and get to hear from him firsthand. I don't want to... I don't want to form an opinion of my president based on the news. I remember when I was invited to uh, Washington during uh, Ronald Reagan's tours, and there was about 200 pastors from around the country that were invited for a special briefing, and somehow or other my name got in there. And so I'm sitting uh, in that room, and Vernon Coop, the Surgeon General, is speaking, and I'm not recalling who the Secretary of State was at the time, came in to speak. And then all of a sudden, you know, there's a, there's a buzz in the room. And maybe half a dozen or a dozen Secret Service agents have entered the room. Now, you, you know, they may think they're being unobtrusive, but they open the door and they go and stand over in the corner. And they, stand, they all look alike. They all got sunglasses on. You know, that's so their head can be this way, but they're really looking at you this way. You don't know they're looking at you because their head's pointed that way, but they're really looking that way. So you got three on one side, three on the other side, probably others I didn't see. And so we know it is going to happen. What is the it? The it is not that somebody's going to come out and uh, say, well, the president can't make it today. So you have the secretary of of um, education coming out. You know that's not going to happen. It wouldn't have all these guys in. And so one of, his, one of his cabinet members comes out, it was a woman, and says, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce to you the President 
of the United States of America. And like it was rehearsed, every one of us is up on our feet and applauding. Are, are we applauding the actor, Ronald Reagan? Hey, Ronnie, I saw you in a movie. You were really good. How'd you fall out of that saddle without hurting yourself? <laughs> Did we see him for his, his, his policies? I don't think so. We were standing in the presence of the king. Come on. I think that what reaction would be the same uh, regardless of, of, of presidents that I've liked or not liked. And I won't tell you the ones I didn't like. <laughs> but I think when they were introduced, I would stand and applaud because I'm applauding the office. And once you lose the respect for the office, You've lost what holds your country together. Come on. Come on. Glory to God. I, did, I, I don't want to go down that trail. <laughs> but, but that's where we are as a nation. And you and I have got to be those who not just live with respect, we speak it. Come on, we speak it. If you don't want to honor our flag, find another flag you can honor and move to that country. Amen. You have to agree with everything. I don't agree with everything you say. You don't agree with everything I say. But we're either in this company together so the company can survive, or I want the company to prosper and you want it to fail. In which case, I will have no, no choice but to oppose you with everything I've got. So a lul is when the king is in the field. And we have a different perspective on it, that the king happens to be our father. Let me just take a, a, a minute on that. You know, uh, you've heard me say this in the past, but far too often within Christianity there's this teaching that for the Jews God was a judge. For us Christians in our area, he's our father. As if somehow Yeshua came up with this wording, our father in heaven, by himself. That was common. Look in, so, you don't have to look these up. Psalm 68, 5. He is described as a father to the fatherless. A father to the fatherless. In Psalm 89, 26, we read, He will call out to me, You are my Father, my God, my Rock, and my Savior. Come on, Holy Spirit's telling us right in the Scriptures that in the Old Testament they could call out that God is my God, God is my Rock, God is my Savior. Why don't Jesus was the Savior? He is, but so is the Father. And He is my Father. Where do you ever, nowhere to call out, You are my Judge. You are the one waiting to hit me over the head. Where do we ever get that diabolical teaching against our father? As if somehow he was strict and terrible in his younger years and now has become a senile old man. Deuteronomy chapter 131 reads this. There you saw, Moses speaking to the people, there you saw how Yahweh your God carried you as a father carries his son all the way you went until you reached this place. Constantly in the Old Testament, analogies of God as a father. And in Jeremiah 31.9, uh, he says, For I am a father to Israel. But in Malachi 1, verse 6, I think is one of the, the chief ones that, that seals it. A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If I am a father, where is the honor due me? If I'm a master, where is the respect due me? Says the Lord Almighty. If I am a father, how on earth could Malachi the prophet say, this is what God says, if the father, father, we didn't know he was a father. Of course they did. In Elul, we have a very interesting 
understanding. This is the month because it's coming up to Rosh Hashanah. It's coming up to a time where we, we, we clear the calendar and build the new year, ending at Yom Kippur. And Yom Kippur is the best example of what the atonement was all about. And if there's no atonement, there's no you, Christian. If there's no atonement, then throw out the New Testament and the Old as well. All of Christianity is based on a man dying, carrying the sin and the sickness of the world on his body like the scapegoat into hell, dying dead, and rising again. And where is the sin that was on him? It's in hell. And where is the sickness that was placed on his body? It's in hell. He did not come up sick. He did not come up filled with that sin. He carried it like the scapegoat carried the sins of Israel out into the wilderness and died. If there is no atonement, then there is no such thing as Christianity, and you've got a myth. When we come to Yom Kippur, it's all about atonement. So what's that got to do with Elul? Elul is a month when we're to be fellowshipping with our Father so we get prepared to stand before him in his role as judge. Think about it. In an earthly court, you have a, your father's a judge, and he's a judge in an earthly court. And lo and behold, you commit a crime. And the day of the court, you haven't seen your father in months. He's a judge, and you're doing your own thing in life. Maybe years. And you show up for your court date and find out the judge is your father. Now you haven't talked with him. You haven't fellowshiped with him. You haven't sent him a Father's Day card. Come on. You, you, you haven't said, I love you, Dad. You haven't done anything to acknowledge his existence. And now you're going to stand in front of him as he's going to be the one to pronounce judgment on your life. I, I don't know about you, going to court is scary enough. Under those circumstances, I think it would be pretty scary. If only I had, why didn't I do, I mean, all the thoughts that would come. But what if your father, the judge, look at the docket? And he looks and says, wow, next month my son is going to be on trial here. He reads what you're accused of and reads what the case is. And he says, I I'm going to take every afternoon off a little bit early and go visit my son for the month. Shows up at the son's place of work as you're getting out of work and says, your Dad, what are you doing here? Well, I just had some extra time. I wanted to just see how things are going with you. And spends maybe 15 minutes with you, while you before you get in your car. And then the, the next day, you drive home and he shows up at your home. It's okay if I come in? I, I, I've got an hour before my next court case. I, I just thought maybe we could spend an hour together. And he did that, day one, day two, day three, day four. Every day in the month leading up to your trial, your dad, the judge, came just to see how you're doing. Maybe at times you laughed together. You reminisced about times when you once were close. He had opportunity to express his love for you. Son, I always knew you'd be better than what you're doing. I always know that. That's in you. You're not who you're living. You're, you're better than that. 
Do you think there'd be a difference at the end of 30 days walking into your dad's court? That speaks volumes to me. Of course you would. My dad is the judge, but he's my dad. My, my dad is the judge, but I have absolutely no fear that he doesn't have compassion for me. There's no room in me to believe he wants to hurt me. I'm going to come into the presence of, of the Lord having fellowshiped with him. But what do we do as Christians? In our linear walk, we can't learn that. Because we're not circling around and saying, what was Elul about leading up to, to Rosh Hashanah, leading up to the days of awe, and leading up to Yom Kippur? Because the church threw all that out. And now, well, I said a prayer 10 years ago, but I know that I know that I know I've not circled around that at all. I've not come back every year and revisited my commitment to him. I've not had an opportunity every year to think about, yeah, I remember when I raised my hand and said, Jesus, I make you the Lord of my life. D is that still true in my life? Can I raise it up a level? Is it a higher level of commitment because I'm this? No, I'm walking in a line like this where pretty soon I begin to deny that that was even real. Come on. And so we're, we're, we're in a point this month, and, and I encourage you to get on the internet and uh, look at some of the teachings on Elul. I'll send out uh, the, the series of there. This rabbi has half-hour teaching every single day. Actually, you can get it on your, on your smartphone every day it comes through. Powerful, powerful. But a cause to look at yourself and say, do I really want to go down this road and find out sometime I turn around and the good days are so far back I can barely remember them. And I have no clue how to get them back. No clue. How do I get, get my family back? How do I get to where, where I had hoped we would be? How do I get to those things? Because I'm on this linear journey through life trying to find the newest thing that will stir me up, the newest job, the newest person, you know, a new spouse, new kids, new this, new job, new car, none of which fill that up. When all along, we've been grafted into a worldview that says, family, we're coming around again. Another opportunity to come into the season of standing before your father, knowing he is your father. Amen. Did you get anything out of this tonight? Father, we do thank you and praise you for the presence of your spirit tonight who so adequately teaches us. I thank you that he takes the words of my mouth, combines them with the meditations of all our hearts so that he is free to point out areas of our own life where we can recover things that may have been lost, where we can enter season at a higher level than we ever have, where we can realize that our Father's desire more than anything is to fellowship with us. And so, Heavenly Father, we invite you to be part of our life each and every day. In Yeshua's name, amen.